Um, yes, thank you, Reiner, and thank you, I mean, the customary thanks, but also truly many thanks for the organizers to have invited me to speak here. I, first of all, let me get the, the time right. Um, I think our panel has this, um, how can I say, this ambitious aim to say what is, what is happening with EU citizenship at times of crisis. Um, and I think and hope that my, my talk, which is fairly introductory, raising questions rather than giving answers, is a um, good introduction to the talk of, um, of Claire later, which I understand will give more the, uh, the analysis of EU citizenship and what it means. And I believe we're qu quite complementary. Um, what um, I would like to say first, why, why was I, I mean, I'm not, so much a citizenship expert, I'm a migration expert, and why was I interested particularly in EU citizenship? It is because um, through uh, studying migration, and although now intra-EU migration is no longer called migration, it's called intra-EU mobility, in reality, in sociological reality, it is migration. Um, and that makes, uh, ma made me think how are a new, new, mobile, uh, new mobile EU citizens, so if you don't mind my saying new intra-EU migrants, different from old, earlier intra-EU migrants. And actually that makes you think also when is EU citizenship important? Actually EU citizenship is not so much important when are, you are at your own country of national citizenship, since after all national citizenship has precedence um, and, and is more important in all practical terms than EU citizenship, but it becomes important when you move to another member state because it offers you a rather advanced um, a set of rights um, compared certainly to other migrants. So, however, I mean, this, this might be just the theory and the practice might be quite different. Um, looking at how many people move within the EU, um, actually, the number is relatively small. I, it stands now at around 3%, and that's basically after a big boost that it has had after 2004 and 2007. Now, of course, one has to, to take into account two um, phenomena in disguise. On one hand, the appearance of um, intra-EU mobility after 2004 and 2007 uh, was, nece was not necessarily a mobility that took place on those years or after, but it was rather an emergence of a population that in many cases was hidden because it was an undocumented migrant population. Um, secondly, at the same time, it creates um, a hidden population to the extent that the new EU citizens that um, joined the EU at 2004 and 2007, liberated from the bureaucracy of stay permits and, and, and all the problems that this entailed, um, many times thought they don't need to register anymore. They have free movement, free residence. I mean, in, in many countries, and actually the practice and the administrative terms dif differ among countries. So in many cases, they just did not want to have anything to do with public authorities anymore and stopped registering. So uh, we have, I think, uh, both an emergence that does not reflect mobility and also a certain disappearance or lack of adequate statistics um, in this sense. Um, However, what is uh, perhaps most interesting is, uh, and, and what, as I said, uh, caused my interest in this, is the discrepancy between the legal rights and the actual sociological realities. So I think on one hand we have the challenge of has um, the law, has the policy, has, have EU citizenship norms and the way they're implemented, are they so advanced and simplified so as to provide for a, um, a rather harmonious and you know, common framework of rights that is e easily intelligible to the average citizen who is not necessarily a university graduate, nor a lawyer, um, nor a public administration graduate, to know what, what their, their, their rights are and where to, um, to seek assistance, especially when they don't speak the language of the country to which they're moving. So one question is the codification of the rights in a way that is easy to use for the citizen. And if I may say that both um, research that we have done in intra-EU mobility and even my own experience as a mobile legal citizen says this is not the case. Um, and then the more sociological aspect of this, which is twofold. One, 
it comes from an analytical point of view of the street level bureaucrat. The street level bureaucrat in a local office, in a municipal office that has to apply um, your EU citizenship right is often not informed about what are your rights. Um, the, sometimes they even, um, the research that I'm going to present some quantitative findings in, in a minute showed in some cases they said, well, um, I don't, this, this is 27 countries, I don't remember them all, you know. So they were, they were telling a Romanian national that he is not an EU citizen. I said, well, you're 27, I can't remember the, all, all the countries, let me, let me check. Or they may... I mean, depending on the administrative culture of different countries, and my own expertise comes mainly from Southern Europe, they may require some extra papers because having a paper in the file makes the, the, the functionaire feel more secure that they've done their job properly, so better ask for more papers rather than less. So this is one aspect that I think needs um, much more empirical research, and, and, and we hope to study this in the near future. And, and the second thing is how... Um, economic realities, labor market realities, shape, again, the rights and the norms. So, um, again, research that I, I would say um, is really on, on the age between intra-EU mobility and pro migration, properly speaking, showed that, for instance, in 2004, upon entry to, um, to the EU, um, suddenly Polish nationals and in 2007 Romanian and Bulgarian nationals would offer to work without welfare um, uh, payments and thus became more competitive in the labor market because they did not need the welfare payments because they didn't have a permit to renew anymore. So instead of becoming an EU citizen, becoming a way that guarantees your rights, and you, you can go to the public administration and say, I have rights, I want to claim them. I, have, I should have portability of healthcare, of pension. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a mobile citizen in all respects. It rather meant that it was creating perhaps unfair competition, but very realistic competition in the labor market. And it was actually giving one more window of opportunity for employers to get the cheap and flexible and um, uninsuranced labor force. So this is, these are the, um, some of the uh, uh, analytical remarks that I would like and the critical remarks that I would like to, to say about what is really the value of EU citizenship for intra-EU uh, uh, mobile citizens especially at a time of economic crisis when a competition for jobs becomes harsher and when resources, welfare resources in particular, um, become more scarce. So, um, of course, EU citizens have more rights than, um, uh, than other migrants, but they're certainly not equal as, as, national, as nationals. Um, I want, however, now to turn to a more positive view, which is also relevant for the, um, at a time of crisis. Are intra-EU mobile citizens really pioneers of European integration? Because, after all, European integration is a lot about free movement. It was, at least, about the common currency. Now I doubt how much it is about the common currency. But it is about creating a European society that has very, how can I say, doesn't have borders or the borders are really quite low. So I want to present some um, initial uh, uh, findings from a project that uh, where actually also Valentina Bettini is, is involved um, and another um, colleague uh, from Florence, Eto Redecchi, and, and several colleagues in different countries in, in Greece, Spain, Italy and France, which is about really these pioneers of EU integration and their patterns of civic and political participation. So. Um, the really some kind of highlights that I want to, to mention today come from a survey of 2,000 interviews, 500 in each country, 125 from each nationality, which shows these four countries because they have in common their being Southern European. Of course, France is less typically Southern European than the other three. And we chose the four nationalities because there are, four, um, there are two new um, member states and two um, old member states, they are present in all the countries and they've been among the most mobile um, nationalities, um, I think, for Romanians and Poles, um, even for those who don't deal with migration, you know, that Romanians and Poles have moved a lot. They're, they're the most mobile nationalities within the EU. But Brits and Germans have also been relatively famous for their so-called sunset migration or quality of life migration to the south. So we really wanted to compare 
their views on the EU, their knowledge of EU citizenship rights, their attitudes towards civic and political participation. Now, I'm not sure to what extent this is visible, but maybe I can, I can summarize what this uh, graph shows. Uh, first of all, we wanted to compare their, their view, their positive or negative view of Europe, comparing on one hand movers and stayers. So people of the same s uh, nationality or citizenship, if you want, that have moved compared to those who, are in the c who have not moved, who are in the country of origin. And there is a clear message that among the new um, uh, among the old member states, those who are mobile are more positive about Europe. Um, as regards the, old, the new member states, um, there is a contradictory finding. So among the movers, those that have a very positive view of Europe are higher among the movers, but those who have a fairly positive view about Europe are higher among the stayers. Now, we have to, to dig deeper into this contradictory finding, but obviously our guess is that those who are movers have also seen, have seen the, the potential, the opportunity of moving because they are EU citizens, but they have also seen the dark face of this EU citizenship, the uh, inconsistencies of, of the rights, the fact that they are often treated as second-class citizens in the countries where they're headed to. Comparing the image of Europe uh, by country of residence without looking at, uh, at the, the different, um, at the citizenship of the people responding, we see still that intra-EU migrants in each country, so the 500 people we interviewed in each country, um, had more positive views than the natives who obviously had not moved. There is a slight discrepancy there in, in Spain, and again, we have to dig deeper into more qualitative research. Um, one, again, suspects that maybe it has to do with the acute phases of the crisis in Spain. On the other hand, one might say, why then not in Greece? Um, what I find, however, one of the most important findings of this research is what do our, our, our respondents consider the most important feature of the EU? I remember a study that we conducted in another um, European project some 10 years ago. It was just before the euro currency was introduced, and it was again a quantitative survey administered through uh, the Eurobarometer, and uh, we were asking people what is important for you as being a uh, European, and overwhelmingly everybody had replied the currency and being able to move freely and reside within the EU. And now you see that the common currency <laughs> is going down. The positive, of course, things of this is that there is a going up of common laws and democratic uh, governance. I think this is, this is quite an interesting finding, but of course, while the, how can I say, the hierarchy of the three things is the same among citizens of old and citizens of new member states, um, there is, uh, uh, like among the citizens of the new member states, the percentage of importance of the currency and of democracy is quite lower than that among, um, among citizens of the old member states. Uh, however, one has to, to look closer to their experiences, and I think in this, uh, perhaps it's a more meaningful uh, thing to look into when people have migrated. So when we see people who migrated before 89, we see that democracy and common laws is more important and free movement is still, of course, the primary, you know, the primary element of importance, but much less so than for people who migrated after 1990 and in particular after 2004. Um, I think similarly, it's interesting that the common currency is, is less important for uh, citizens of Poland and Romania now, again, here uh, we need to dig deeper into, into these results because one might say, oh, it is because they don't have the euro or be it is because of the oiro toiro that they have experienced. Um, at the same time, the, 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 the same could be said about the UK not having the euro. Um, again, I think an important finding to highlight is that in Greece, the euro is, has an all-time low. <laughs> and I think the, <laughs> the explanation for this, <laughs> I don't need to say. <laughs> um, uh, we, we asked several questions because we were trying to figure out um, whether people thought Europe is um, the EU or Europe is not the EU, and we asked it in different ways. Overall, 
Uh, there is an overwhelming, I would say, um, agreement that Europe is the EU and there's no Europe besides the EU. Of course, this is not 100 percent, but it is it is a, a majority of people who respond. Um, uh, yes, there's no Europe beyond the EU. Yes, the EU is Europe. Um, generally, there's a positive image among um, these are data only from our own survey, not from Eurobarometer. So about movers. So there's generally a positive image. Uh, of the EU, but with a small, as you can see, just very small advantage over those who said no, they don't have a positive image of the EU. But when we asked them if they feel attached to the EU, they said yes, they are. Um, it's interesting to say, well, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure we need to, to look into so much detail about the, the, post, the attachment to, to, to Europe and the EU. I think what's most important and drives us back to the question of EU citizenship is knowledge of EU citizenship rights. Four out of ten of our respondents don't uh, admit to have a poor knowledge of their EU citizenship rights. When we went into the qualitative interviews, some people admitted that the information is there, but you just have to look for it. However, it is uh, interesting, of course, that again, as, ex as would be expected, the old, uh, the members, uh, the citizens of the old member states have better knowledge um, than the citizens of the new member states. Yeah, I'll be even less. Um, again, f here um, w we we uh, checked our data to see what is the relevance of. Uh, the migration period, and although, as I said, poor knowledge is a general feature, we can see that it is quite lower for people who have migrated from um, 89 or earlier. At the same time, uh, I think there's a marked discrepancy with those who migrated from 2004 and afterwards. Now, one may question whether this has to do with uh, the time, the length of migration. So, if you've lived in a country for only a few years, um, it's likely that you haven't had. Uh, the time to find out more about your EU citizenship rights, while if you've lived in a country for 15, 20 or 25 years, you've had um, many, for instance, many contacts with the public administration, per perhaps you bought or you sold a house, so you found out more about your rights. Um, we, um, we, we want to analyze this further statistically in terms also of income, you know, profession, education, etc. But we think it also relates to the different um, uh, to the different socio-demographic outlook of the newer migration versus the older migration. So migrants from the new member states tend to be younger on one hand, but also tend to be um, in lower, uh, you know, in, in a lower socioeconomic stratum with uh, lower education and worse jobs. So that also testifies that to be a citizen, you have first to have certain conditions that allow you to be a citizen. And I come to my conclusion. Um, of course, the, this, uh, this MOVE Act project is also quite much geared towards making policy recommendation, uh, recommendations of how you can enhance the civic and political participation of mobile EU citizens um, uh, within the EU. Um, if we can summarize what we found about what these intra-EU movers do and whether they are pioneers of European integration, I think, yes, probably we can say they are. The overall, regardless of citizenship and country of residence, they are overall more positive about the EU and, and Europe than what we call stayers. They're more politically active than their fellow citizens um, who have not engaged in, in intra-EU mobility. This difference is particularly stark in, um, among people of the new member states. And they're also politically active at the transnational level. I have not presented here our data on these particular aspects like voting behavior, participation in organizations, because there's not enough time. Uh, uh, but uh, we, can, we can have it in the discussion and I can, I can present some highlights. But uh, certainly we have seen that, uh, as I said, especially among people from the new member states, there's more uh, civic and political participation when you have moved, when you have migrated, than if you stayed at home. Um, we also found that they are quite transnational in their media consumption, and here there is also an interesting finding that Germans and Brits keep their links with their home, home country media. So even after 20 years of residence in Spain, Spain, France, Italy, or Greece, they will always consult um, their home media, while this is not the case for Romanians and Poles, who once they start being settled in the country, they will then start consulting the local media. Now, where do we go from here? 
I think there is a paper or a book <laughs> which says mind the gap, but it just, um, I, did want, I did not want to steal the neologism, but I think it, it was, uh, wh what is my main uh, message in this talk? And I think it is about the gap between what the EU citizenship uh, norms and, and policies say and what happens in reality. And uh, as I said, I think we need to know more and of course do more in terms of policy as regards implementation and uh, the level of street level bureaucrats, which also, which also I think is a particular aspect of EU integration, that you have very different administrative and political cultures in the member states, which bend EU norms in all areas, including in the EU citizenship area. Another aspect that is very important that has come out in particular from our qualitative interviews, and I think it's often debated on why the EU is not so integrated as the United States, is the question of language. I think language, although it is the richness of the European heritage, it is also a big barrier. A lot of the problems in becoming politically active or civically involved in getting information even about merely your rights or getting a proper job according to your qualification um, start with knowledge of the language. So if, if you don't have uh, language knowledge, then a lot of the rights and the, the opportunities become uh, void. Um, I think our, our, our research also points to the fact that EU citizenship is, uh, and like citizenship in general, is not just about the legal relationship between the individual and the state, but it has a very important collective aspect, a collective aspect and this is not only again about uh, individual voting behavior, but about being civically involved in organizations and the role that these organizations play, not only for instance in classical migration literature, but in particular with regard to intra-EU mobility in, in bringing the EU citizens closer to their country of, of destination. Um, the overall integration of EU movers in the political system is not as easy going. Just one highlight, the meaning of left and right is very different among new member states and old member states. And the last, <laughs> uh, the last thing is uh, voting rights. Sometimes people know that they have the right to vote in European and local elections, but they don't know the practicalities of registering. And a last, I think, interesting highlight is we found an inverse relationship between feeling attached to the country of settlement and voting in European elections. So those who felt more attached to the country of settlement, they tended to vote less in European elections. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a positive thing for EU citizenship because actually it shows that after all, it is the nation state, it is the country that counts more rather than Europe, which becomes only instrumental.